あのロックマンが帰ってきた究極の痛快アクションゲーム「ロックマン2」「ドクター・ワイリーの謎」The first Mega Man game, released in 1987, was not successful enough to justify the immediate development of a sequel. According to Roy Osaki, director Akira Kitamura wanted to make a sequel to Mega Man, but producer Tokuru Fujiwara was against it. Kitamura then went to Capcom Vice President to get permission to make the game. Capcom allowed the development team to create a sequel on the condition that they work concurrently on other projects as well. The staff spent their own time on the project to improve upon the original by adding more levels and weapons, as well as improving the graphics. The project supervisor of the first Mega Man invited Inafune to the sequel's development crew. Inafune was working on a separate game at the time. On a previous game, Inafune worked as an artist and character designer, but became more involved in the production process of the sequel. Inafude would let her recall that this would mark his second year at making the Mega Man games. He said that he had to mentor a new kid, which opened up a whole new world of stress for him. However, I'm sure the game's short development time of three to four months was also stressful. So we, on our own accord, got together, spent our own time. We worked really, really hard, you know, just 20 hour days to complete this, because we were making something we really wanted to make. Probably in all of my years of actually being in the video game company, that was the best time of my working at Capcom, because we were actually working towards a goal. We were laying it all on the line. We were going to do what we wanted to do. And it really showed in the game, because it's a game, once again, that we put all of our time and effort and love, so to speak, into designing it. KJ Inafune, April 2004. Due to the limited amount of cartridge space available for the first game, elements such as planned enemy characters were omitted from the final product. The unused content was later transferred to Mega Man 2. The team was limited by the graphical capabilities of the console, and designed characters as pixel art to maintain consistency between the designs and the final product. Some design elements, however, would be lost in translation. The gameplay system from the original game was kept for Mega Man 2, but the team included more traps for the player to navigate. The game's three support items were added to aid the player because of complaints from consumers and Capcom's marketing department regarding the original game's high difficulty. Inafune's supervisor was especially unsure about the usefulness of the energy tanks. The first game did not have any influence from fans. But for the second game, Kitamura wanted to get ideas from players and put them in. The developers allowed input from the public by including boss designs created by fans. Capcom received over 8,000 boss submissions for the game, although even the designs for the final eight robot masters were tweaked. Inafune intended his artwork for Mega Man 2 to be more anime than the first game. A second difficulty setting was added for the North American release. The original version was labeled difficult, and a normal setting was created that made the arm cannon and boss weapons more powerful. The soundtrack for Mega Man 2 was composed by Takashi Tateishi, along with Mega Man composer Minami Matsume, included for having her work on the credits theme from the first game repurposed for the title screen, and for co composing a minor part of the melody for Airman Stage. As with the previous game, the sound programming was handled by Yoshihiro Sakaguchi. Tateishi's initial compositions of the game were of varying moods, with some of them being considered too cute by Kitamura, requesting them to be changed to fit with the rest of the soundtrack. A single fragment of this decline concept remains in the game as Crash Man Stage Theme. The widely praised piece, used for the first two Wily stages, was heavily compromised due to data limitations. With Tateishi being forced to use the first eight measures of the song multiple times throughout it. The intent to compose a song exclusive to the second stage was also quickly abandoned for the same reasons. It is currently unknown if this song still exists. Veteran video game cover illustrator Mark Erickson painted the North American box art, 
which included Mega Man firing a pistol instead of his trademark Mega Buster. Erickson explained that he was unfamiliar with the game and was told that Mega Man used a pistol. However, this is still a bit better than the original box art used on the original North American game. The game would release for the holiday season on December 24th, 1988 in Japan, eventually making its way to North America and the PAL regions in the following years. It was only then that fans would be able to continue their battle against the evil Dr. Wily. Upon popping in the cartridge and booting up the game, you are treated to a title screen sequence which explains the backstory of the original game, as this game will pick up right after the first game ends. After his initial defeat, Dr. Wily, the series' main antagonist, creates his own set of robot masters in an attempt to counter Mega Man. These now include Metal Man, Air Man, Bubble Man, Quick Man, Crash Man, Flash Man, Heat Man, and Wood Man. He also constructs a new fortress and army of robotic henchmen. Mega Man is then sent by his creator, Dr. Light, to defeat Dr. Wily and his robot masters. I gotta say, usually every time I boot up this cartridge, I never skip that opening sequence, as that is something that is iconic and nostalgic to me to this day. Having that slow opening theme build up to that awesome rocking soundtrack is something I could still listen to to this day, but definitely used to blare out on my old tube television back in the day. Add to that that awesome chrome logo, the Star Wars-esque dissipating into the background design, and Mega Man's hair blowing in the wind, and I am instantly sucked into this universe. And although there is no set pattern to attack these stages, I always choose to start with Metal Man. It is here where you see this game is a platform and action game just like its predecessor. Each robot master at the end of each stage features a unique weapon and stage related to their weapon's power. The first thing you may notice about this level is the conveyor belts moving around on the ground. Some parts move you forward and increase your running speed, and some move you backwards and slow you down. After getting the energy tank, you go back to the upper platform, and then you have to pass through a series of spiked clamps, called press. They cause high damage when you touch them, including the chains holding them. So you have to let them drop and then move under them when they're going back up. After passing them, you will enter a tunnel in which moles, or screws, appear from the floor and the ceiling. They're not hard to dodge, and killing them often yields large capsules, so if you kill a bunch of them, you can get health or weapon energy very easily. The last part of the tunnel has a moving ground, which makes dodging the moles a bit harder, but just don't go too fast and you'll be fine. Now if I had done other stages, I can get this one up on the high ledge, but instead I'm going to dive down onto the next screen which has no enemies, and then drop again. Moving forward, you will see a gear hanging in the air. When you approach it, a Piero bot, the little clown on top of there, will drop onto it and ride it towards you. The gear keeps moving towards you if you kill the Piero bot, so I would suggest destroying the gear instead. Next are two Blocky's enemies. These are enemies that look like four cans stacked on top of each other, and you can dodge the cans if you're playing in difficult mode. Next are these annoying springhead enemies, which you can just pass instead of killing and you'll take a lot less damage. It took me a little bit to learn this trick, but once I did, I just went right past them. After passing those, you're already to the first boss, Metal Man in this case. He usually stays on the opposite side of the room as you, so he will only move from his place if you approach him. His main attack is shooting out metal blades. Just jump over the blades and shoot, and watch for a change in direction that the floor moves. After he goes down, you earn the metal blade. Then it's on to the next stage.
Airman stage is made up almost entirely of floating platforms over pits, so if you're not good at jumping, you're gonna get there. As you approach the edge of a platform, a large goblin head will appear, and this is how you're going to traverse through the stage. Be careful not to jump on it right away, because the spikes will slowly raise. They're non-lethal, but they can knock you off of the edge. Wait until the spikes drop, and you can jump across to the next platform. They will also send out these little small heads that swarm you, so watch out for those as well, and take them out if necessary. After this, a Lightning Lord, which is an enemy in a cloud, will approach you throwing lightning. You'll have to kill him, and then ride his cloud platform to the next area. After you make it through the main stage, you'll make it to Airman, who uses the Air Shooter where he shoots out a bunch of little mini tornadoes and then blows them up towards you. He will do this a few times, then you can jump across the stage and start firing, and then jump the other way. I decided to go after him with my Mega Buster, and that eventually let me defeat him. Next I went after Crash Man, and this level is one big tower with a lot of ladders. You climb up the ladders at the beginning, ignoring the cylinder enemies. You can kill them easily with the Metal Blade if you need to. Once you reach up to the top of the ladder, you can kill the enemy and continue heading upward. After you get out of that area, you have to ride these platforms while avoiding these spinning enemies that are floating around the screen. It's easier said than done, but after a while you'll get the hang of it. Then it's time for an area of really long ladder climbs that you can easily fall off of when you get hit by enemies that are thrown at you. Again, this took me a few tries, but I was able to get through it. Once you reach the top, there's only a few more enemies to defeat before you can enter the boss chamber and then face off against Crash Man. Crash Man jumps around the area throwing bombs at the walls and the floor. You can run under him to dodge his bombs and shoot him at any time. He always jumps when you shoot and returning fire with a crash bomb, so you must jump to shoot him in the air. He is weak to the air shooter, so that is why I used it to defeat him. Next is Bubble Man stage, where you start out on a platform over a pit. You can make your way across the several floating platforms, killing all the frogs that get in your way. It's kind of tricky to kill the mini ones with the Mega Buster, so you can try the Metal Blade if you want. Next you'll come across the shell enemies, which I just ignored and decided to keep dropping down from. Next you'll find yourself in an underwater area, and I had to keep reminding myself that the top of the ceiling is lined in metal spikes, and yes, they are one hit killed no matter what you do. So if you jump too high underwater, you will have to restart this area. Take out the giant fish enemy, and you can make your way through some of the tightest platforming sections in the game, as these little metal spikes are very close to where you need to make all of your jumps. Once you're out of there, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump away, and then you're on your way to the enemy for this stage. Bubble Man uses Bubble Lead, where he shoots out one to three bubbles, then swims diagonally up while shooting out mini bubbles at you, then swims down to repeat the process. These are not too hard to dodge, since you can jump high, but remember of the spikes on the ceiling once again. I have found that the best time to hit him is when he's swimming down, but since he's weak against the Metal Blade, you can just keep spamming him and eventually the enemy is defeated. Next is Heat Man Stage. You have to jump over the lava pits in the beginning, avoiding some of the other enemies as they're going through there. And again, this is a lot of careful platforming because the lava fields are one-hit kills. And stretching over these narrow gaps with enemies that can knock you off very easily, it's kind of a cheap move. But again, once you get through it, it's pretty rewarding. Next, after that area, you have to make your way down, and then you have this area where you have the magical appearing floating platforms that you have to try to make your way through. I don't know how many times it took me to get through here, and this little enemy at the bottom kept slamming into me, but eventually I was able to make it through as well. Just keep at it, there's really nothing you can do. These blocks also make an appearance in the next area where you have to wait for them to appear while enemies are coming out through holes in the wall. Again, this is a bit frustrating at times, but eventually you can get through it. 
This area is a bit more high stakes, where you have the disappearing blocks and reappearing blocks over a lava pit, so if you make one mistake, it is instant death and back to the beginning of this area for you. Thank goodness for save states. I don't know how I used to do this as a kid, but I didn't really want to go through this again as an adult. After that, there's this tiny area with this leaping robot, which I just decided to take damage and avoid and just keep heading through here. And then it is on to defeat Heat Man, who uses Atomic Fire, where he tosses three flames at you, which form pillars of fire once they hit the ground. When you hit him, he will use a Body Crash, where he will stop, raise a heat shield for a second, and then streak across the room as a Comet of Fire. You can jump over him when he's doing this, but keep hitting him to prevent his flame attack. Since he is weak to bubble lead, that is what I decided to use to defeat him, and eventually he fell. Alright, now it's time for... Woodman. The first part of this stage is just best spent running past these enemies as fast as you can until you get to the first ladder. Then defeat this metal wolf down here that breathes fire for some reason. Eventually you'll make it to this little open area back in the air where you have to defeat these enemies and then make a ladder climb down. And then just make it past these jumping rabbits. Then pass the mechanical sprinting ostriches and then you've made it to Woodman finally. Woodman is weak to fire, so use that as much as you can, and eventually he will fall. Flashman stage is fairly simple. The floor is slick in this level, so you will slide for a bit after stopping, and you'll have to pick up speed when you want to start to move again. This level branches off into three different paths eventually, and after you make it through this area, you will go to an area where you keep dropping down to different areas. And after that, there's just one more little area to go through where you'll have to move and defeat these enemies to get past them, and then you're on to Flashman. When you get to Flashman, he will jump around the area for a little bit, and then he will try to freeze you in your tracks and fire pellets at you. It's not hard to dodge him when he's moving, but to avoid his shots, you'll have to time it so you're out of his range when he tries to freeze you. He is weak to crash bombs, and defeating him will give you a time stopper and a wall crawling platform. Quickman stage is fairly straightforward. You'll have to drop down and eventually get past these enemies to go to an area where they'll have to time your drop perfectly to where you don't get hit by these incoming barrages of laser fire. This is probably the area where I had the most deaths and had to go back because I kept mistiming my jumps or hesitating and it resulted in my instant death. There is also another area where the lights continually go out and then it's on to more platform dropping until you get to the boss, Quickman. FYI, you could use your time stopper to make this level a little bit easier. For some reason, I just didn't think about it when I was playing. But anyway, Quick Man will jump very high around the area and shoot sets of three boomerangs at you. You can run underneath him when he jumps, and you can also jump over his boomerangs. He is weak to the time stop and the crash bombs, so it shouldn't take too much to defeat him. After you beat him, it is on to the Dr. Wily stages and what I think is one of the best songs in the entire game. That is probably one of the most iconic themes from Metal Man. I mean, this game has a bunch of great tunes in it, but that one is by far one of my favorites of the entire series. 
But anyway, navigating through the Wily stages, you'll have to use all of the special abilities and weapons that you gained from the special robot masters you defeated in order to get through the toughest platforming stages of the game. And yes, this also includes defeating all of the robot masters again before you face off against Dr. Wily. This boss battle is a little strange because Dr. Wily seems to transform into this green alien dude and you fight him in outer space, but once you defeat him, he's pretty harmless after that. Getting to this point was not an easy task back in the day and required multiple times of attempting to get through this game, but I'd never get tired of the ending and see it as a great achievement even though I was using save states and rewinding a lot during this gameplay. Though the first Mega Man game had relatively low sales, Mega Man 2 was a huge success. Since its 1988 release, Mega Man 2 has sold over 1.5 million copies worldwide. Mega Man 2 was praised by critics, including four reviewers from Electronic Gaming Monthly. They stated that it was much better than the original Mega Man game, citing the improved audio and visuals, new power-ups, and much appreciated password system. Some did express disappointment that the game was a little less difficult than the first game, However, others have stated that this was an improvement to the gameplay by removing excessively difficult elements, giving the game a broader appeal to more gamers. More modern reviewers have stated that this game is a must-have for the system, and Games Radar has ranked it as the second best NES game ever made, calling it the pinnacle of the 8-bit Mega Man games. The game's soundtrack has been very well received by critics and gamers alike. Mega Man 2 is a favorite among Mega Man fans, as well as my personal favorite, with many calling it the best in the series. Critics have also referred to this game as the best in the series. Several publications consider the game to be a very big critical success and have it listed high on top game lists. At the end of 1989, it was ranked as the top game on Nintendo Power's Top 30 list, and in 1997, Electronic Gaming Monthly named it the 73rd best console video game of all time. After this game, Kitamura chose to leave Capcom and join the company Takeru, where he worked on the game Kokoron instead of Mega Man 3. KJ Inafune claims the success of Mega Man 2 is what made the Mega Man series a hit that continues to spawn sequels. This game has helped define the platforming genre, and while many of the conventions of the original Mega Man series were defined by the first game, Mega Man 2 added crucial conventions that were retained for the rest of the series. The traditional number of Robot Masters, for the series being 8, was first used in Mega Man 2, rather than the 6 that the original used. It was the first in the series to include an opening cinematic. This game introduced the Energy Tank item, Special Movement items, teleporter room, and password system, all of which became staples in future games. The energy tank became the series' iconic health refill item, and later served as inspiration for a promotional Rockman E-Can drink. In developing Mega Man 9, producer Inafune looked to the first two games in the series for inspiration, with Mega Man 2 serving as a standard to surpass in order to meet fans' expectations. In the now-canceled Mega Man Universe game, it was to feature a remake of Mega Man 2's story campaign, as well as feature customizable characters and levels. However, in Super Smash Bros. for Nintendo 3DS and Wii U, Wily Castle, as depicted in Mega Man 2, appears as a selectable stage in both versions of the game. This stage would later return in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. In 1990, Tiger Electronics produced a handheld version with a bridge gameplay. Mega Man 2 was remade in 1994 for the Sega Genesis under the Mega Man The Wily Wars compilation featuring updated graphics and sound. In 1999, Mega Man 2 was re-released for the PlayStation as the second of six Rockman Complete Works discs, though only in Japan and under the original Rockman 2 title. It is largely identical to the NES release, but had a number of bonuses, such as a Navi mode for beginners that present the players with a slightly remade version of the game, as well as detailed encyclopedia content, image galleries, and remixed music. Mega Man 2 was included with nine other games in the series in Mega Man's Anniversary Collection for the PlayStation 2, GameCube, and Xbox, released between 2004 and 2005. The game's emulation is identical to the re-release contained in Rockman's Complete Works. 
Also in 2005, Mega Man was released alongside other Capcom games as part of a plug-in-and-play peripheral by Jack Pacific. In 2007, Mega Man made its way to mobile phones. In celebration of the ninth game's release in September of 2008, Capcom Japan released the game on August 26, 2008 in Japan, and a North American release on September 15, 2008 on the Wii Virtual Console service. PAL regions had gotten the game earlier on December 14, 2007. In March, Capcom released the game for iPhone OS, while in September of the same year, the Complete Works version of Mega Man 2 was released on the Japanese PlayStation Store, making it available for download on the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation Portable. Inafune expressed a desire to remake Mega Man 2 similar to Mega Man Powered Up, but stated that such a project was dependent on the commercial success of the original. A tech demo for the Nintendo 3DS called Classic Games was shown at E3 2010, displaying more than a dozen classic games, including Mega Man 2, using 3D effects. The game was released on the 3DS via the Virtual Console in Japan on August 8, 2012, and was released in Europe and North America on February 7, 2013. Other spin-offs of the game included a novelized version of Mega Man 2 in the Worlds of Power series published by Scholastic in 1990. The novel mostly follows the game, even offering game hints at the end of some chapters. The game's story was also adapted into the third story arc for the Archie Comics Mega Man comic, titled The Return of Dr. Wily. And to date, Mega Man 2 is available on almost all the modern platforms in the Mega Man Legacy Collection, which is where I find myself playing the games most often due to the ability to rewind when you make a mistake, saving me so much time when I go to replay these titles. And with that, that'll wrap up this review of Mega Man 2. If you'd like to see another in-depth review, I have Mega Man 1 already posted on the channel and linked in the description below. If you'd like to see another in-depth video on Mega Man 3, please let me know in the comments and I'll get to work on that. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A special thanks to those Patreons you see on screen. Also, if you like what you see, please remember to leave a like and click that subscribe button on your way out. As always, I want to thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.